I love sharing with you and hearing you sing these songs of praise. It encourages me. Last week in my lesson, I mentioned that many of us Christians in America have come to feel entitled, and it's because we have been the majority in our country. But there is this entitled mentality that we seem to sometimes carry. And and I don't think that's seen any more clearly than in this annual drama that we call the Christmas War. Uh, The the big offender this year seems to be Starbucks. And I've got to tell you, as I look at these two cups, the one on the left is the one that they have used in the past few years during the Christmas time. And the one on the right is the one they're now using. And there are some Christians who are up in arms about this. And I look at those and I'm wondering, what in the world do snowflakes have to do with the birth of Jesus? Why does this matter to us? Why is this a big deal to some of us? Can I suggest to you we need to be wise in choosing our battles And is is it any wonder that many people in our culture think that we're nuts? Uh, And so every year, there's a different retailer, it seems like, every year that decides to use the term Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas. And some people, some Christians, get upset because they want to do their Black Friday materialistic shopping to Christmas carols like the early church did. Listen, we Christians are always going to be able to speak Merry Christmas to each other. But who is it, and it sounds bullyish to me, who is it that decided that it is a mandatory, pol- mandatory policy that all retailers in our country are to isolate and marginalize potential shoppers to say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays? Is it Walmart's responsibility to share the good news or is it ours? It's our responsibility. We're the ones that need to be shouting, Merry Christmas. He has come. It's our responsibility. And so let's choose our battles wisely. And so today I speak to you and say, Merry Christmas and Happy Holiday. Now, Christmas is coming this Friday. And did you know the average American over the holiday season is going to gain seven pounds? Did you know this? The average American eats 16 pounds, I mean 16 times his or her body weight in a year. A horse eats only eight times its body weight in a year. So I have made the decision, I am committing to eating like a horse over the holidays. (laughs) It's interesting, every year it seems the two best-selling genres of books are books about cooking, cookbooks, and books about dieting. And so evidently, we want to learn how to make delicious food, and then we want to learn how not to want to eat that delicious food. There's this paradox working within us, and you know what? We bring that same kind of paradox to Christmas. Christmas is something we crave, and yet Christmas is often something we wish we could avoid. We can't wait for Christmas to get here. But we don't always look forward to it. Because for many people, Christmas is a beat down. Depression soars during the Christmas season. And so ironically, 
While we sing that it's the most wonderful time of the year, it's also the most stressful time of the year. Something seems to be missing from Christmas in our day and time. And what's often missing is real joy. Not something you can wrap up and put under the tree, but something that we can have. Uh, there's two basic views of joy. The first view is probably, or is the more popular view, and that is that joy is found out there. Most people believe happiness is a result of happenings. There is an old English root word, hap, which both of those words come from, and hap means chance. And so, Many people operate under the assumption that there is a chance that I can have a joyful Christmas. There is a potential that I can have a joyful Christmas season. But there's also a chance that I won't. And whether I have this joy or don't have this joy, it's really out of my hands. It's dependent upon happenings. It's dependent upon what's going on around me. And people who live like that live an if-only kind of life. If only this will happen or if only that will happen, then I can be joyful. Joy is determined by happenings that are outside of my control. And so there's a chance that I will get to be joyful this Christmas season. Judith voiced, or viorst, I'm sorry, viorst. And some of you, especially you school teachers, might be familiar with this poem that she wrote that's entitled, If I Were in Charge of the World. She writes it from the viewpoint of a child and says, If I were in charge of the world, I'd cancel oatmeal, Monday mornings, allergy, allergy shots, and also Sarah Steinberg. Now, I'm assuming Sarah Steinberg's not her best friend. If I were in charge of the world, there'd be brighter night lights, healthier hamsters, and basketball baskets 48 inches lower. If I were in charge of the world, you wouldn't have lonely. You wouldn't have clean. You wouldn't have bedtimes or don't punch your sister. <laughs> you wouldn't even have sisters. <laughs> if I were in charge of the world, a chocolate sundae with whipped cream and nuts would be a vegetable. All 007 movies would be rated G, and the person who sometimes forgets to brush and sometimes forgets to flush will still be allowed to be in charge of the world. That's cute, but there's one problem with that. You and I are never going to be put in charge of the world. And so if this first view of joy is correct then few, if any of us, are going to have a joyful Christmas. But there is another view. It's not as popular as the first view. This other view of joy says that joy isn't out there. Joy is in here. This view says that joy is an internal reality that's not dependent upon external factors. And this view is the biblical view. Scripture says that when we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, he gives us his Holy Spirit to help us in walking the Christ life. And as we surrender more and more to the power of the Spirit living in us, he will produce his fruit in us that's enumerated in Galatians chapter 5, part of which is love and peace and joy. He transforms us from the inside out. And the joy that he gives us is a joy that doesn't come from out there, but from in here. 
independent of what's going on out there. And so many of you know that a verse that's very special to my family is my daughter's life verse that she had hanging up in her house, Romans 15, 13, that picks up on so many of the themes that I've been talking about already this morning when it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if this is true, then joy can be anybody's reality because it is not dependent upon things that are beyond my control. And this is one of the first promises of, of, of Christmas. In Luke chapter 2, the angels come to some shepherds who are out in the field. And one of the angels speaks these words to the shepherd. shepherds. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Not just some of the people, not just those who are experiencing favorable circumstances. Real joy is dependent upon embracing good news. And so what is this good news? Well, I want to give you three things this morning. First of all, God is above us. And this is important. This is the first step in appreciating this joy that we're offered. How can joy exist in a world if there is no meaning? If we're just cosmic accidents who, when we die, become nothing more than a part of the circle of life and we are no more, pray tell me, how can we find joy in that? Some would argue that it's possible. A number of years ago, American humanists began putting signs on buses. They began in Washington, D.C. I think they've even come as far as Fort Worth now with this sign that says, Why believe in God? Just be good for goodness sake. Now that sounds really trite. But there's an inherent problem with that sign. The inherent problem is how do we determine what's good if there is no God? Who is put in charge of the world to the point that they can determine what is good? You want to entrust that to Hollywood? To the media? How about Congress? You want to entrust that to our Congress? How about, uh, how about maybe Kim Il-sung? He would be a good one maybe to entrust that with. I mean, who gets to determine what is good if there is no God? If there is no God, there is no standard by which we determine what is right and what is wrong. And there would be no hope that someday that which is wrong will be righted. There would be no hope that someday everything will be made right and that justice will be seen. And so today we've got these angry atheists who are writing these best-selling books one after the other and they all think they've got the ace card when they, when they throw this question out and every one of them does it. If there is a God, why is there so much evil in the world? And that is, that's a question for the ages. I've struggled with it myself. But if one believes that all that has happened around us is the result of nothing more than an accident, where would one get the idea that what's going on all around us isn't the way things are supposed to be?
You see, I believe, and Paul, Paul touches on this in Romans chapter 1. I believe that all of us are divine image bearers. All of us have something of God and the knowledge of God inherent within us. And because of that, we intuitively know as we look around this world that something's amiss, that something is wrong. And we are hardwired to believe that there is purpose behind creation. You see, I think joy begins when we acknowledge that there is a God above us. And this God wants to be known. And you know what? That's good news, isn't it? Because if he didn't want to be known, guess what? He wouldn't be known. The fact is, this God that's above us wants to be known so badly that he came among us. He put on flesh. And he became like you and me. John 1 and verse 18, John says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is closest in relationship with the Father has made him known. So if you ever have in your mind, if you're ever wondering what is God like, John tells us, look at Jesus. Jesus, in fact, said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God came in the flesh to make himself known. God came in the flesh because he wants to be known. And joy in a world that I cannot control begins with the conviction that there is a God above me and that he is in control. But there's more than that. He's not just above me. He's for me. He's for us. We sing a song, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth? Why? Why did Jesus put on flesh and come to this mess that we call earth? Well, the song provides the answer, doesn't it? Because he loves me so. And there's not another reason I can think of. It's because he loves me so. In fact, it's the truth behind what is perhaps the most quoted verse in all the Bible. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Christmas is God's announcement that he will not give up on us, that he's doggedly pursuing us. As I look around the world, as I, I, as I look around at the universe, I can know that somebody made it. And I can know that that somebody is powerful. And as I study, though, the design of the universe, I can know that that one who is so powerful is also very wise. But how can I know that this powerful, wise one is for us. I've shared this story before, but when Joe Torre became manager of the New York Yankees, the, at that time, radio announcer's name was Phil Rizzuto, and Phil was interviewing Joe Torre, and he said, Joe, wouldn't it be... Wouldn't it make more sense for the manager to manage the team from the press box where he can see the whole field? And Tori said, no. Upstairs, you can't look into their eyes. And we couldn't know God. We couldn't know his love if he remained upstairs. But he came down where he could look us in the eye. You see, his power is so great 
that he could come down. But his love is so great that he would come down. And so Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6, as Paul is describing Jesus in all his humanity, in all his humbleness, says this. Do we have the slide for that? And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He became a man. He became a servant. He became a substitute. In Genesis chapter 3, we discover, we learn that sin occurred when humanity thought that it could take the place of God. In the New Testament, salvation occurs when God came to take the place of humanity. And so we know John 3.16. But to fully understand John 3.16, we really need to, we really need the truth that's expressed in 1 John 3.16, which says this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. God's not just above us. God is for us. Don't think there are any nails that could have held Jesus to the cross. What held him to the cross is love. As we live in a world that we can't control, a world where every day we have news of the craziness of things that are going on all around us, it helps to know that there is one thing that will not change, and that is that we matter to God. Listen, you are important to God. You are special. To God. And that ought to fill us with joy, brothers and sisters. A joy that circumstances and happenings don't affect. There is a God who is in control. And that God is for us. But Christmas in particular reminds us of something else about this good news. God is above us and God is for us, but God is with us. God doesn't want to have a long-distance relationship. And since we can't yet meet God in his world, God came and met us in ours. I mean, try to just, just try to wrap your mind around the fact God wanted so desperately to come and connect with us that he was born in an animal feed trough. No one can, can ever say that he claimed royalty, uh, claimed the privileges of royalty when he was here. The above God came to be the with us God. And so Matthew 1 and verse 22 says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so the issue is not just if God is real. The issue is that God is real close. And why is that good news? Well, because he's come so close, he understands our pain. You know, we're told Emmanuel means God with us, but Emmanuel suggests, I've been there. And, and so when you and I are experiencing hurt or feeling lonely or betrayed or sad, we can know that in heaven God understands. He understands because in Jesus he's been here. 
And he's experienced everything we experience and more. Now, he hasn't promised to remove all the pain from our lives while we're here, but he's promised to enter into our pain with us, and he's promised to walk in that pain with us, and he's promised to understand with us. But this also means that he's on our side. We will never go through anything alone. I came across this interesting verse in 2 Timothy, probably the last letter Paul wrote. He can see the handwriting on the wall. And he says in verse 16, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever just felt like everyone's betrayed you and left you? But then listen to what Paul said. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. And what's interesting to me is as I read this, I I got to thinking, I wonder how Paul knew that the Lord stood at his side. Did he have a vision? Did he, did he have a dream? Did God speak to him and say, I'm here at your side? Or was it simply a powerful and yet quiet settling in his soul? We don't know. But regardless of how He was aware of that. Paul says that at the moment that he thought he was alone, he wasn't. And he says that he received power and strength because God was with him. And do you remember what the last words of Jesus are in Matthew's gospel? Jesus said, surely I am with you for a little while. No. Surely I'm with you always. Some would say, well, he's just talking to the apostles. Well, it's kind of hard since what's the next phrase? To the very end of the age. I can sum up why so many people experience no joy during the Christmas season, and I can sum it up with one word. It's the word fear. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's coming. I don't know what yet next year holds. I, I don't know about the future. Well, that's what fear tells us. But joy tells us, I know who has come. And I know who is coming, and I know who is with me. And so Isaac Watts was this great composer. And hundreds of years ago, he wrote this song, and I've got to tell you, as a kid, for years I thought he was using bad grammar. It's only in recent years that I've come to realize what a brilliant theologian he was. Because he wrote these words to a song we're going to sing in just a minute. And he said, joy to the world, the Lord what? Has come? That's not what he said. Joy to the world, the Lord will come? That's not what he said. Both, those are both true. But what did he say? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. He is present. He is here. He is reality. And so the the real issue, the real question of Christmas shouldn't be, what do you want for Christmas? The real question should be, who do you want for Christmas? Joy doesn't come wrapped up in a package with a bow under your tree. Joy comes in a presence. 
And if you have, who is come, you've got all the Christmas you need. So we're going to sing about that. If you've never been baptized into Christ and accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, come today and do that. Come and, and seek prayer here. If you, if you want to visit with an elder and his wife and, and pray with them, go to room 102. But let us sing this great Christmas story together. Let's stand.